The Week in Art is sponsored by Christie's. Visit christies.com to find out more about the world's leading auction house since 1766. Auction, private sales, online, art, anytime. Hello and welcome to The Week in Art. I'm Ben Luke. This week, Jasper Johns, the curators of the joint show at the Whitney Museum in New York and the Philadelphia Museum on taking a radical approach to a retrospective of a radical artist. I talked to Carlos Basualdo of the Philadelphia Museum of Art and Scott Rothkopf of the Whitney Museum of American Art about the simultaneous career surveys in two museums with intimate connections with Jasper Johns. Also this week, Venice's tourist problem. Are Venetian authorities subjecting tourists in Venice to unprecedented surveillance? I talked to Anna Summers-Cox. And in our work of the week, we discuss an installation by the Finnish artist Oti Heiskanen. Before all that, the latest series of our sister podcast, A Brush With, is now complete, so do check out the latest in-depth artist interview, A Brush With, Thomas J. Price. Subscribe wherever you're listening now to hear that and to explore the back catalogue with conversations with more than 25 artists, from Michael Armitage to Tacita Dean. Now, Jasper Johns. Even if they're organised by multiple museums, major retrospectives of artists' work tend to begin in one venue and then travel to others, of course. But in an unprecedented collaboration between two museums, the latest survey of Johns' work, which opened last week, the first in the United States since the mid-1990s and containing work made across seven decades by the now 91-year-old artist, has been organised jointly by Scott Rothkopf at the Whitney Museum of American Art and Carlos Basualdo at the Philadelphia Museum of Art, and has just opened simultaneously at both venues. It's called Mind Mirror and the principal theme of the show is the doubling and repetition that carries through Johns' career from his earliest work. He's also a real artist's artist whose influence has now stretched across several generations of followers. One of them is Sarah Z, who I spoke to on our sister podcast, A Brush With. Here's what she said about Johns' work after a visit to The Whitney Show. I just saw the Jasper Johns show, which is phenomenal. Um, I think a lot of people relate my work to Rauschenberg, which I love, but I also think John's, if not as much or more, as someone I I learned a lot from, think a lot about, um, and this cross between sculpture and painting, you know, even from the most basic idea of having this kind of playfulness with the black silhouette jar that has the, you know, the face on the side, you know, the simple thing of saying, I'm an image, I'm not an image, you're making me into an object, I'm not an object. Um, and then to, to paint objects, to paint a flag, to paint a, um, a target, to paint a can of brushes, and say, you know, that paint is a material that we can build a sculpture out of paint. I think one of the things that's interesting to see the show is I think he almost has a palette of marks that, and I feel like this myself, a palette of marks And that mark can be silence, that mark can be a toothpick, that mark can be a color of paint that you like. Um, But we know this, he has these repetitive, very intimate, and you know, they have this kind of urgency that you don't know why they are there. Like, you know, the the young boy, or the crisscross marks, you know, or as I, I explained, the, you know, the vase that comes out of two profiles. But they have a kind of urgency to him that somehow comes through. I love that about art. I feel like when there's an urgency in the making of the work or there's a serendipity in something coming together, that is actually conveyed somehow through inanimate materials to the viewer. And so there's this kind of real intimacy that's surprising in his work because he doesn't necessarily give you the reason why it's intimate. But the mark is so lovingly, so tenderly applied and with such precision. You can hear the rest of A Brush with Sarah Z wherever you're listening now. So here's the conversation with the curators of the John's Retrospective, Carlos Basualdo and Scott Rothkopf. Carlos, I'd like to begin with you because... In the catalogue, you make very interesting points about exhibition making being a relatively conservative form. Can you expand on that a bit? Sure. I think that, you know, for most people, I mean, the common understanding is that an exhibition is a sort of a neutral medium and that what matters is what you put inside, really. And for many people, it doesn't really even matter how you put it inside. You know, that's a sort of denial of the actual experience of the viewer, because our experience is what informs us. 
and our, our experience is an embodied experience. We perceive things through our senses, really. And so how we move in an exhibition, how we uh, traverse it, and how we experience the work in terms of our own bodies, is it matters tremendously. Uh, so I've always been keen on trying to develop a, a form of the exhibition in which the form itself is active. So the form itself is corresponds to the content and tells you something about what is being on display. Uh, and this, this show is no, no exception to that. I mean, one, one thing that it was interesting to me is that ideally you would have uh, an exhibition uh, whose form really resembles, you know, intimately that which is on display, you know, if, if that is at all possible. You know, Carlos, what, one thing I would add to that is I think this sort of supposed neutrality of exhibition making is most extreme when we're talking about surveys and retrospectives. If you look at um, a lot of young curators today who are students, they, their ambition maybe is to curate a biennial at the Whitney or Documenta, where they think that the kind of authorship or the argument of the exhibition is more evident and that a retrospective maybe curates itself. You're just putting works in chronological order as they exist. And I think what we tried to do was to also question that assumption at its core. Tell me about the genesis of the show, because this isn't a show where one of you was curating a show about Jasper Johns and heard that the other one was curating a show about Jasper Johns and thought, oh, no, uh, what can we do about this? It, it was conceived as a joint project right from the start, right? Yes, but we were both interested in Johns to start with, and uh, we knew each other. And uh, Scott and I were introduced, you know, a long time ago. My wife was doing a postdoc at Harvard and Scott was working on... Um, his own degree with Eva Lambois, and then he's written so beautifully about Jones. And I, I, I knew f for sure that Scott had a personal relationship with Jones. So when we both started conceiving the idea of working with Jones, I think it came naturally that we could do this together, you know. Jones's work lends itself to this kind of treatment more than almost any other artist living today, right? Well, I think it, it does to some degree. I don't think I would have suggested doing a show like this for de Kooning. Uh, what, what makes it ripe for this exploration is that there's a lot of work. It's a nearly 70 year career, which is not unprecedented, but pretty unusual if you think of someone making their mature work at such a young age and, and living quite so long. You see, um, the incredible variety of the work on paper, the prints, the drawings. And so there was a big corpus to dig into. But even apart from that, and something Carlos and I talked a lot about was that the notion of John's kind of endless return to different motifs, his extreme interest in ideas of mirroring and doubling, whether it's a work that's in black and white and also in color or one that's symmetrical at its core, like Corpse and Mirror. These were um, some of the works that sort of gave us permission to organize the show in this way and to use this question of the double or the echo or the mirror as the organizing principle of the relationship between the two halves of the show. The relationship between part and holes, John's writes so much about it and he seems so keen on really exploring that. And so it was almost like an open invitation for us to think about those same elements, those same procedures, if you want uh, to, uh, Scott and I speak about them as uh, that operational logic, you know, that is effective in the work uh, to be put on display. That, that's what we try to do. We try to put the operational logic in the work, which is something that Jones himself refers to endlessly on display. Yeah, you know, you could think of it almost like the echo effect that's an essential part of Jasper's process. If you make a drawing of a flag or a painting and then you go back and redraw or repaint that same motif or even that object, as he's done often with his drawings, uh, it's really interesting to imagine that there's already a kind of delay in time and space between his own thinking around that work, but also how anyone might see them. So we're just sort of presenting that delay in time and space across our two cities. Exactly. And of course, there's, there's this intimate connection between Johns and the two institutions, aren't there? And there are also there's these two very early moments. On the one hand, Carlos, can you tell us about Johns' seminal encounter with Duchamp's work in Philadelphia? Yes, and it's quite beautiful. You know, I mean, his work was in a group show at Castelli early on. And then Robert Rosenblut said, well, this is Neo Dada. And he was, you know, he was wondering what Dada was, really. And so him and Rauschenberg decided to come to the museum in 1958. And uh, there's so many wonderful anecdotes about that trip. And then, you know, through Nicolas Callas, who was a 
poet and art critic, they met Duchamp and it started, I mean, Jasper started a very meaningful relationship with Duchamp. I mean, he's been thinking very, very uh, much, very deeply about Duchamp for many, many years. I think he's still thinking about Duchamp. Yeah, exactly. And Scott, there was, of course, this really important moment at the start of Jasper's career, which is that he he shows in the Whitney Annual, not the biannual then, but the annual in 1959. And he wasn't actually surrounded by, for instance, Robert Rauschenberg at that time and, and, and his peers. He was he was he was fairly alone in that sense and in company that was pretty intimidating. Right. I'll say, you know, I mean, it's so interesting. Jasper is one of the only people alive who I know, um, including the granddaughter of our founder and the artist Alex Katz, who remembers visiting all four Whitney museums. He first came to the Whitney on 8th Street in the 40s as a teenager, where he remembers seeing Pollock. He showed in our second location, which was in the 50s, during the 50s, and the the 50s, I mean, the block, uh, the streets, uh, next to MoMA. And then, of course, in um, the 70s, he had a great uh, early survey, a retrospective at our former home, the Breuer Building, with an amazing catalog by Michael Crichton. So it's been a, a long journey. He's shown in three of those four places. Um, and we have now more than 200 works in our collection, although the first was not acquired until the early 60s, which put us a little behind a place like MoMA. And, you know, as you were mentioning, when he was showing at the 50s, I would say the Whitney was maybe not quite as adventurous curatorially as it became known to be in the 60s, um, because it was a little bit more looking at a different kind of abstract painting or figuration. And he was neither of those things. That's really interesting. When it comes to John's early work, he, he used that famous phrase about the stuff that he was using in those paintings, which was things the mind already knows. To a certain extent, aren't his paintings for an art audience or anyone with a level of familiarity with American art essentially things the mind already knows? And therefore, does it become difficult, therefore, to curate and to find new avenues into that work, to tell new stories about them to a certain degree? Well, isn't it interesting, uh, Ben, that the, what the mind already knows, I mean, the mind already knows everything, right? <laughs> I mean, because the mind is basically the vehicle through which we know. So, I mean, we assume that, the, uh, that jo- but John's by saying, well, things the mind already know, he means, you know, symbols that are common property. But the truth is that reality is a common property. Uh, and, and that makes you think about the work in a very different way. And I would say that's what we tried to do, you know. You know, I think your point about the mind already knowing a flag and the mind knowing Jasper Johns's painting of a flag is a really interesting one. And, you know, to some degree, we were determined to push a little bit against that latter fact. The idea that you know these works so well from an art history textbook or maybe a MoMA postcard was both a benefit in terms of the recognition of this body of work and also a problem because it maybe makes people think they don't have a lot more to learn about Jasper Johns. And I think we really wanted to jostle um, these perceptions, to put things in new context, to add in new works, to frame things through different, um, or look at them through different theoretical or methodological lenses. And so uh, hopefully people will see some of these works they think they know quite well as if for the first time. And then those early works are, for instance, an example of what you call basically 10 sets of dual case studies. So can you explain the case studies idea? We came up with 10 different ways of looking at Jasper's work, his process, his turns of mind, if you will, uh, each of which is articulated through two sets of examples, one in Philadelphia and one in New York. So if you take the idea of Jasper Johns in place, places where he's lived and worked and how they've affected his life and his art, at the Whitney, you'll see South Carolina, and at Philadelphia, you'll see Japan. And there's a number, these 10 um, examples of that sort of two-part articulation of the same idea or methodology. Which it also implies that looking at the work, you know, as this play between fragments and totality, because we didn't want to have an overall dominating, colonizing curatorial voice, you know. This was always a dialogue. And, you know, when you have two people, you have a lot of voices, really. Yeah, right. And so we wanted to articulate that in the show so that even though there's a ba- basic thrust of the show and it's mostly chronological, there's different perspectives. So you're looking at this through different lenses. And the way in which I've been describing it, and I think that Scott would agree, is that, you know, the work itself is like a kaleidoscope. You know, there's elements that come in and turn, and then you have different images with the same elements. And the shows themselves, I think, act as kaleidoscope. I agree. And, I, you know, I think it's important to say also that we created 
these 20 galleries together. It was a, a total collaboration. So we came up with the 10 ideas and the pairs of examples. And sometimes we might've had three or four examples that could have articulated the, those ideas. So we had to narrow them down to say, you know, which were the strongest examples or which ones would not be redundant with other galleries that we were creating. And we took the lead in some cases on galleries that don't appear at our respective museums, like Carlos really thinking a lot about the According to What and the South galleries that you find, in fact, at the Whitney. Um, it was only when it came time to do the final editing of the checklist and the arrangement of the works in the physical space of the museum that we sort of, you know, had to each take responsibility for our own venue. But other than that, it was truly a, a collaboration through and through. I'd like to explore some of the different case studies. I'm particularly taken by this one called Constellations because you mentioned according to what there. And this is a really interesting aspect of, of Johnsy's work, how he rethinks different imagery, different clusters of imagery and reworks and then, and then repositions them in his oeuvre, right? Yeah, and I think that you can say that, you know, through this uh, rotation of the kaleidoscope, there's moments in which things seem to coalesce and seems to coalesce because those images are somewhat the summation of earlier imagery or the fountain through which other new imagery emerges. And, and that's, I think, quite clear. We both, I mean, Scott and I had these wonderful boards. And I have to say that Scott first developed it at the Whitney and immediately copied it to have a version of that in Philadelphia, in which we have all the paintings from the Catalogue Resonne in a board. And you could really see how there were certain moments in which everything came together or certain moments in which everything really started. And these magisterial paintings, you know, are we chose two. And one is according to what uh, which tells, you know, many stories, but including the story of John's relationship with Duchamp. And then we have Untitled 1972, which again tells many stories, but it was a springboard for Jasper to develop a relationship with, with Samuel Beckett. Yeah, so in a way, each of these galleries is almost like a mini exhibition focused on or around a single painting. You have um, this idea that Carlos was saying of something that's synthetic and you see the works that preceded in some cases and also generative. So you see works that grow out of this painting, sometimes years or in the case of Philadelphia, even decades later. That's really interesting. I wanted to explore something that you said in your essay, Scott, about um, how John's ushered in all sorts of strands of contemporary art that followed him which was developed by as you put it wilder progeny so people like you talk about um donald judd following through one particular aspect and um eva hesse and david hammonds and others and i wonder does that mean that in a way you're positioning john's as somewhere between a sort of truly radical developer of new art but also a sort of an umbilical link to the past too yeah, I had forgotten I'd use that phrase, wilder progeny, but I, I do think what you said is true of my understanding. Um, I think he was an incredibly radical thinker, but I think he is also a rare case of an artist whose own, let's say, influence was superseded to some degree by so many other ideas in such a short period of time. So the other day I was thinking that Jasper was maybe like Moses, if I could be over, overly grand and biblical in kind of getting everyone to the promised land. But, but did he go inside? You know, he, he is in some ways the last of a certain kind of easel painter, if, if you can say such a thing, you know, that there's a kind of, a commitment still to a canvas that's a certain shape and format. Obviously, he has things coming off of it. But then you look at the, the, the progeny, the minimalist, the conceptualist, the pop artist, and it's almost easier sometimes to see them as more a part of the time that we're living in, that their ideas are more present for a lot of younger artists. Take a, a figure like Warhol, for example. Uh, and that can make Jasper look maybe more of the past. And I think this question of him as this bridge is a really important or umbilical cord. And it's something we really thought to, um, you know, emphasize in the show, not by pointing out who he influenced or inspired, but by making the work feel alive and fresh um, as much as we could. And, you know, Ben, the interesting thing is that um, John's casted such an enormous shadow so early on that it almost like it's his own work fell into that shadow, you know, and that's what we wanted to dispel. Let's say we wanted to dispel uh, the sort of uh, confusions about uh, the relationship between what is being commonly described as early and later work. In our view, there's no such a thing. You know, there's a continuity. Uh, I think that was a, a very important goal because once you look at the continuity, which is so strong, 
then, you know, you tend to think about Jones in a wider historic, art historical arch, right? I mean, then you realize that, yes, of course, he was so seminal for many, you know, art movements in the 60s and so forth, but truly his whole dimension can be appreciated in a much wider art historical perspective. And then I think, you know, the work itself becomes more important than the earlier legacy. And then you're ready to think about the legacy in a much more all-encompassing way. Mm -hmm. And I think sometimes people need a reminder of that. You know, I mean, looking at the ale cans, the painted bronze and the Saverin, for example, or any of those painted sculptures, which there are not that many of them, uh, and they're not... They're sort of well known, but maybe a little forgotten by younger audiences. If you think that the one idea there that Jasper didn't even develop that far, honestly, gave birth to, you know, Warhol's Brillo boxes or the work of Bob Gober or Jeff Koons's painted, uh, inflatables or Via Selman's early sculptures with the comb and, and the, you know, eraser. It's kind of amazing to think that this was a, a an area uh, that Johns didn't even go that far into, honestly. And then you have Fishley and Vice and it, the list goes on and on. And so it can be easy to to take Carlos' example of having a, a legacy, you know, cast that shadow over the work itself because the legacy almost seems bigger than the original idea, which of course we don't think is true, but I can see how it happens. Absolutely. Um, Carlos, I wanted to come back to you on Duchamp because of course one of the paradoxical elements of John's is that he's a total disciple of Duchamp, but his art is, as well as being very conceptual, is, is incredibly retinal. His visual acuity is extraordinary, isn't it? Can you say something about that? It, it really is. He has this capacity of looking at things almost as if anticipating meaning, which is incredible, you know, and that I think explains his fondness for, you know, uh, language games, but also visual games, right? Uh, I think that um, he is an extraordinary craftsman and he values tremendously the very act of doing something. I think process is something that he enjoys, very likely because for him it's some form of play, right? So he produces these incredibly seductive objects uh, that invite us to think about them as something final, but they are truly step for something else constantly. Uh, so there is this paradox between the illusion and the seduction of the object and the total conception of every object as a step towards something else, of the importance of process. The only thing I can refer to that is to say that that is a sign of his greatness, that he's both able to suspend and emphasize our own relationship with individual objects. And, you know, we have to remember, too, that there are so many different Duchamps, you know, probably an infinite number. Carlos would know better than I if he started counting. But the idea that there's this link between, you know, Jasper and the ready-made, of course, is one very obvious one. Uh, but if we think about the imbrication of language in the pictorial field, if we think about things that shape shift and change meaning, you know, when I look at that show, uh, there are so many places where I see Duchamp's thought, legacy, inspiration, and, and they are um, almost too many to catalog, but we have to kind of keep that alive, even in the later, more surreal pictures. Let's not forget the Duchamp of the Etant Donné, uh, which we know that Jasper went to see uh, so shortly after it was unveiled. So that's a whole different idea of the body, of cast objects, of sexuality. Uh, and so we see that too in Jasper's work. And of making, to, to Scott's remark, I mean, Duchamp was a very, very meticulous maker. And both in the notes of the uh, large glass, you know, the green box and the bottom valise, we see that it, in the large glass is, itself, there's all this attention to detail. Uh, he said of himself, you know, I think that one thing that you can say about me is that I'm a meticulous man. And you can certainly say that about John's. Um, I wanted to talk about, obviously, we talked about the intimate connection with the, the two museums, but also one of the ways in which that affection, if you like, that, that Johns has for, for the museums is displayed is through works from his own private collection. Can you say something about the works in the show that come from his own studio or from his own collection? You know, it's interesting how many works he has kept. I think our wildest explorations were in the field of works on paper because he has produced his incredible amount of archival prints, you know, so he, he, he keeps all the intermediate steps, 
you know, that he develops while uh, working on a print, which is very rare in itself. And he signs them and they're extraordinary. Uh, and uh, he has kept a very large portion of his drawing uh, work, which, you know, has some incredible surprises. So Scott and I made, made countless trips to Sharon, where he has his studio looking at all this work. And, and uh, we were very lucky because we were able to incorporate a lot of it in the show, uh, including many things that have never been shown or have been shown only rarely. Uh, and Scott has a really wonderful, uh, he's so attuned to, you know, the eccentricities and the peculiarities of the work uh, that say so much about Jones, you know. Uh, one thinks of Jones in a normative way, but the truth is that there's a texture there that I think Scott was able to bring out in many of the choices. Well, I think uh, I would say we did it together, Carlos, but I appreciate that. Um, you know, for me, in, in thinking about your question, Ben, it's like there are these two big buckets. And one is the works that Jasper has kept, some for, you know, decades and decades, that are quite well known, that actually live on long-term loan at major museums, like uh, his Target or Field Painting, uh, which came to us from the National Gallery of Art, but are still Jaspers. And then there was this great, you know, undiscovered country Carlos was alluding to of works that he's kept that have never been seen or shared. And that was um, such an incredible, you know, process to make our way through that work. It was so inspiring. And I think, you know, it, it's, it's an open question. Did he keep those things because he loved them and thought they were best or because they were weird and maybe he didn't want to put them into the world uh, or maybe some combination of the two? Or, or because he wanted to use them. Yeah. I mean, uh, that, w w one thing I wanted to know was, you know, uh, does he keep some of these things close because he's going to reuse them in the work? He wants to refer back to them. He wants to look at his previous work. You know, he, he does that all the time, Ben. And it's very interesting that you go to the studio and you see that he pulled out <clears throat> an earlier work. And there it is, he's making a new work and he's looking at an earlier work. And there's something quite interesting. There's this series of five sculpt metal paintings of skeletons that he completed very recently. And he sold them and he sold them to a collector in Philadelphia. And But he asked for permission to keep them a bit longer. <laughs> And they were there in the studio and they were generative for the work that he was doing. So he does that all the time. You are completely correct. You know, one of the most interesting bits of feedback that I've had on the show so far was from um, the artist Cecily Brown on it. She probably wouldn't mind me saying this, but she said one of the things she appreciated about the show was that it included these sort of masterpieces that we see as such. I don't think she used that word, but these iconic works and also possible failures. And I was kind of curious to even ask her what those were in her mind, um, because I'd love to have an artist's take on that. But I, it really resonated with me because we didn't start out curating this show by lining up what everyone agreed were indisputably Jasper's greatest works. Um, one could do that, and that would make a beautiful and perhaps satisfying show. But in this research that we did, we looked at moments of inflection, moments of sometimes a lack of resolution in a work, things that would surprise and, and jostle the viewer and maybe have that same effect on Jasper himself. And that was um, an interesting way methodologically to go about this. And sometimes it meant you, you left out really great things that we would have loved to have shown and that their owners might have been happy to, but that wasn't the story we were going to tell. And I think um, the access we had to Jasper's own collection was one of the key drivers in that, that story. You, you know, Scott and I asked him uh, about the working proofs, about the archival prints, you know. So Jasper, when, uh, one question that was very important for us was, if we're showing the archival prints, the different stages towards the final print, do we need to show the final print itself? And he says, absolutely not. <laughs> And so the, the second question was, so why do you, you know, come to a point in which there is a final print? And he says, well, I, I, it's, it's just a temporary stop. I wanted to end by talking about his recent work, because I know that, 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 for instance, in London, he showed Regrets, that series of about a decade ago, which I found tremendously moving. And he is still so active and still, you know, make it, as you say, you, you talked about these recent works, these skeletal figures. Tell, tell me about the recent work, because it, again, it's extraordinarily various, isn't it? Yeah, it is. And I mean, one of the things that strikes me about it and and Carlos and I had many discussions about it was the sense of 
mortality or loss that he was looking at, not for the first time in his work, certainly there's skulls that appear sooner and the sense of loss that permeates a painting like In Memory of My Feelings is real in 1961. But we found these um, really direct references to grief, to despair, to death, whether it's a skeleton or a painting titled I Call to the Grave or a figure of a Marine who's broken down in grief, having lost his comrade. And to think of a artist, a person in their 70s and 80s exploring these themes so directly and so bravely was very profound. I will say Carlos was always really good to remind me that in this examination of death and mortality, there was also a sense of curiosity, of life, of new discovery, and that we shouldn't get too lugubrious at the end uh, or too one note. And, and I appreciated that all along because it was a you know, an important insight to see the work uh, kind of traversing this emotional terrain. Definitely. And, you know, I, I tend to think of it, uh, Ben, as a manifesto. So I think that he has clarified his poetic and makes of each work a manifesto. I think there's a sense of urgency, certainly, that comes with age. And so regrets is one very clear example. You know, I mean, it looks incredibly emotional and it is, but it's also the product of chance, right? And it's both at the same time. And he has done that very, very precisely. So what I would say is this, this recent work, it sort of clarifies the entirety of his poetic in a very distilled and precise way. And his poetic has always been both emotion and the suspension of emotion. Carlos and Scott, thank you so much for talking to us about this great artist. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. Jasper John's Mind Mirror is at the Whitney Museum of American Art in New York and the Philadelphia Museum of Art until the 13th of February 2022. The excellent catalogue, published by the two museums and distributed by Yale University Press, is priced $60 or £50. Coming up, we hear about Venice and tourists and about a work by the Finnish artist Oti Heiskinen. But first, here are a few of the top stories on our website this week. A UNESCO advisory body has put pressure on the British Museum to reconsider its position on the Parthenon marbles, known in the UK as the Elgin marbles. As Gareth Harris writes, a spokesman for UNESCO said that the recommendations were made by the Intergovernmental Committee for Promoting the Return of Cultural Property, or ICPRCP, which promotes the return of cultural property to its countries of origin or its restitution in the case of illicit appropriation. The advisory body helps with bilateral negotiations and offers mediation services. The Greek Greek culture minister Lena Mendoni told the Greek City Times website that the committee recognised, quote, that the issue is of an intergovernmental nature, in contrast to the claims from the British side that it's a matter for the British Museum, and mainly that Greece has a valid and legal claim to demand the return of the sculptures to their place of birth. Sotheby's has announced that it will be selling The Man of Sorrows, a half-length panel painting of the resurrected Christ, thought to date from around 1500, which it claims is the defining masterpiece of Sandro Botticelli's late career. As Scott Rayburn writes, the painting was listed among workshop and school pictures in Ronald Lightbound's seminal 1978 catalogue of Botticelli's works, but it's now regarded as an autograph work by some scholars, including Lawrence Cantor at the Yale University Art Gallery and Keith Christiansen at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. However, Scott Nethersole, a Botticelli specialist at the Courtauld Institute in London, remains less convinced of the painting's fully autographed status. The Man of Sorrows will be auctioned in New York in January 2022 after a global tour, and it's estimated to raise more than $40 million. Attention is on a number of art world figures as information continues to surface from the 11.8 million leaked offshore data files known as the Pandora Papers. So far, those named include the Sri Lankan power couple Thirikumar Nadesan and Nirupama Rajapaksa, who used one of their shell companies to buy $1 million of art currently in the Geneva Freeport, the late dealer Douglas Latchford, who established trust for his family in tax havens shortly after US investigators began linking him to looted Cambodian artefacts, and the jailed Indian diamond dealer and prolific collector. Nirav Modi. You can read these stories and much more at theartnewspaper.com or on our apps for iOS and Android, which are available from the App Store or Google Play. We'll be back after this. 
The Week in Art is sponsored by Christie's. This October, discover remarkable works offered in Christie's 20th, 21st century London season of auctions. The headline auction, 20th, 21st century evening sale, including Thinking Italian, kicks off on the 15th of October and will be live streamed globally to offer masterworks from some of the leading artistic voices of the past century, including pieces by Cecily Brown, Peter Doig, David Hockney and Eligiero Boetti. The post-war and contemporary day sale follows live on the 16th of October to offer works by internationally recognised contemporary artists such as Yayo Kusama, Takashi Murakami and Andy Warhol. No Regrets, the collector's edition and first open post-war and contemporary art online are post-war and contemporary art online sales, offering perfect works for those looking to start building their art collections with highlights by Nicola Parti, Peter Saul, Eddie Martinez, Abudia and Gerhard Richter and partnerships with the Rays of Sunshine Children's Channel Charity and Radiohead. Find out more at Christie's.com. Welcome back. Now, a report in the New York Times this week highlighted how the leaders of the city of Venice are using tourist smartphone data and surveillance cameras to monitor visitors and to try to prevent overcrowding in the city. Next summer, the authorities plan to install much-discussed gates at key entry points in the city. Day-trippers will have to book ahead and pay a fee to enter. So what does this mean for Venice and tourism? How will it affect the problematic balance and ecology of the city? Anna Summers-Cox, the founder of the art newspaper, is a specialist in all things Venice and a former chair of the conservation organisation Venice in Peril. I asked her about the implications of the Venetian authorities' plans. Anna, can we set the context first? What do Venetians think of the number of tourists coming into the city? They absolutely hate them. Um, On the one hand, I mean, the Venetians who live in Venice because somebody did a study of how many people could fit onto a Vaporetto, which are those water buses, and it's 13,000 passengers a day to be comfortable, 17,000 a day to be crowded, and 24,000 a day to be horrid, and they're getting 24,000 a day and more. On the other hand, you know, great cries of horror during um, COVID because there was no money coming in, because it's become a monoculture. And also there's this big problem with, in terms of driving people from the city out, in terms of um, wealthy people coming in, buying flats and renting them out on Airbnb and such, right? Well, uh, actually, it's not so much the wealthy people coming in, because on the whole, the wealthy people um, come in and buy flats and keep them and go and live in them. It's the Venetians themselves and Chinese investors and outside Actually, it is beginning to be investors buying up things and the Airbnb. That that was um, a change in the law in 1999 that has completely changed the use of buildings and um, also the whole hotel economy because it put all the kind of middling and lesser hotels out of business. So the, the luxury hotels are, are being built, you know, the old palaces are being turned into luxury hotels and the rest is t- being turned into B&B, but not, not a B&B in the English sense of, you know, a nice family having a guest or two and some breakfast, you know, the key is in the locked cupboard, you know, kind of stuff. Uh, Minimal care. We haven't talked since the supposed banning of cruise ships. You've written about it on the artnewspaper.com. What's the reality of that? Are they banned? They're not coming through the centre of Venice anymore, which is great because uh, the accident that happened, what was it, two years ago, when one of them, um, the hawser to the the tug snapped and it, it actually went into a quayside, showed that they could actually cut through um, the fundamenta of the structure of Venice um, like a knife through cheese. But they're still coming into the lagoon itself because... Um, what the government has said should happen, i.e. that a port should be built outside the lagoon, um, isn't even begun yet. I'd like to just dwell on this in this story in the New York Times, which is about this sort of monitoring of tourist numbers in Venice, this apparent surveillance culture which is emerging as a means of tracking tourists. How much do you think this is a, a thing and, and indeed a problem? And if people go to the artnewspaper.com, they will see that you actually wrote about this some time ago. Well, it depends on, on how agitated you get about being followed around by the big eye in the sky. I mean, we're being followed around the whole time. And I don't know what kind of technology they're using, whether they're using basically COVID ping technology, which is that they know that there is somebody there rather than you are there, or or whether it's it really is proper surveillance. They can say, you know, Ben Luke is at this moment walking down the Calais, such and such towards St. Mark's. Um, some people might really hate that. 
On the other hand, cars enter London and they're being tracked, you know, the whole time. We, we are used now to, to being watched. And something is going to have to be done to control the numbers because anything that is really desirable now is oversubscribed, whether it's the Chelsea Flower Show or whether it's Venice. There's great confusion about how many people actually come to Venice, but it is about 16.5 million travellers a, a year, of which only 4 million actually spend a night in Venice itself. And uh, the rest are uh, 12.5 million day trippers. And it's the day trippers who cause the problem because they all want to do the same thing. They all want to arrive in Venice um, in the few entry points and they uh, nearly all want to go to St. Mark Square. So that certain um, alleyways get completely clogged up and other parts of Venice are relatively pleasant to go around. I mean, it's, it's really become dangerous apart from anything else. What do you make of these plans that are, you know, this idea of effectively, as somebody puts it, turning Venice into a kind of museum as opposed to a proper city, thriving city, by having so much surveillance and so much monitoring of movement that effectively it's total control? Yeah, well, there's no reason why actually managing the number of people coming to Venice should turn it into a museum. It already is a museum. The things that are turning into a museum are making it so that it's so expensive for people actually, working people, to live in the city, um, making it so that uh, there's so many people you can't actually get around. Um, um, there's a well-known economist, John Kay, and when somebody said, oh, this will turn Venice into Disneyland, he said, what are you talking about? If it was managed by Disneyland, it would be managed much better. Of course, one of the benefits of potentially having an extra charge on Venice is that the very great needs of conservation across the city might be addressed. You know, raising public money from tourists could benefit Venice if that money is spent well. I suppose the big question is, would it be spent well? Ah, well, uh, let, let's deal with with the whole question of how should, how much you should charge. I think that it should be, with obvious exceptions for students, old people, children, etc. It should be around the, amount of, the same amount of money gets charged for, to, to go to MoMA, which is $25. And that should go for what's called project financing, the same principle as a toll on a motorway. Um, so you raise a bond on the international financial markets, which is guaranteed by the Italian government, and the money that is paid by the tourists all goes to financing that bond, and you have completely transparent accounts that say at the end of the year, we spent this money on cleaning out such and such number of of canals in Venice or reinforcing the walls or whatever. And I think that that way people would be much happier to pay a reasonable entry charge. But do you have any confidence that that sort of system that you're describing is the sort of system that would be put in place and would be effectively managed? Because one of the things that you've written about very many times in the art newspaper and have consistently lobbied really for is proper management of, of Venice, because it is mismanaged in all sorts of ways, isn't it? Yes, yes. Italy is going through a very interesting phase at the moment. Because of Covid, uh, it took a financial hit, like most countries, and the European Union has stumping up €430 billion Euros for it. On condition, and this is the interesting point, that certain administrative reforms get put through. And there's a very competent prime minister who used to be head of the European Development Bank, Mario Draghi. And and so it's a bit of, um, not exactly blackmail, but shall we say persuasion. You will have this money if you change, for example, um, your judiciary so that it's, it's more efficient and so on. So the concept of yielding a bit of sovereignty to European, shall we say, supervision has actually been established. And that's what Venice needs. Venice needs an Anglo-European collaboration, not just for the management of things like tourism, but actually the thing that will destroy Venice, which is sea level rise. Well, let's talk about that now, because actually, as you say, in in a sense, all this stuff about tourism and how tourists are going to be managed in the future in in Venice is all academic when you are faced with the very real crisis, which is sea level rise. Tell us the the current situation, because there has obviously been new data, which has come from the latest IPCC reports in terms of sea level rise globally. And how will that affect Venice? The intermediate scenario of the IPCC which is a rise in temperature to around three degrees uh, above whenever they started counting, would lead to sea level rise of up to 60 centimetres. At that point, um, Venice would be flooding at every single high tide, not to mention when there's a storm surge. So you would actually have to, and you would have to keep the barrier shut the whole time. If you do that, then you have the lagoon turning into a sort of stinking 
of swamp. So that can't be the solution. There has to be another solution. Nobody knows what it is yet, but you need to have a, a, a team of experts figuring it out and you need to have a body with the capacity to decide what to do and then to make sure that it is enacted properly. Uh, the model, I would say, is something like the Delta Plan uh, for the Netherlands. But how seriously are Venetian authorities taking climate change? To what extent are they recognising that that is their greatest threat? In terms, you know, we've seen, we've seen this provision to, to try and address the tourist issue, but are they taking climate change as seriously as, as they should? No. Uh, the mayor um, doesn't give a damn. And previous prime ministers haven't given a damn either because they're in for a year or two. Um, and, you know, uh, uh, so far so good is their philosophy. But Mario Draghi is a completely different kind of prime minister and he has actually expressed concern about the future of Venice in relationship to sea level rise. So this is the moment when central government might actually seize um, control of the situation and begin to come up with a drastically diff- different kind of plan. And what about the barriers? <laughs> those, those, <laughs> those barriers we've been talking about for decades. So effectively, the barriers, even if they were to come into operation soon, they, they become redundant within a relatively short period. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, they would come re- redundant in the second half of this century. Yes, you're quite right. I mean, the barriers have been 50 years in the planning and execution. Uh, that doesn't mean to say that they won't be effective, you know, between, you know, this year and next year and so on. I mean, they're, they're, they're vital to stop the water from coming in. It's already rotting St. Mark's Basilica um, on a regular basis. A completely new plan is needed. And above all, you have to persuade people that these very, very expensive, these 7 billion euro um, barriers are not the final solution. They're there for sort of the temporary flooding events. They're not there for the constant ineluctable sea level rise. Okay, so you're saying that the sort of federal government effectively could make a, make a difference to this. But of course, it needs international action as well. And, and of course, there are, you've been part of Venice in Peril. Um, there's another institution called Save Venice. Are those conservation agencies mindful of climate change as much as they are of the individual and what we might now call sort of smaller projects of looking after the individual spaces? They will know about it. I think the American ones, Save Venice, Venice Heritage, can't make any comment with a political implication due to the nature of um, American tax law. Um, you, they, any, anything that has American tax benefits has to stay out of the politics of another country. Venice in peril, I think, is very much involved in fixing individual buildings and I don't criticize them for it because at least at the end of the year you know you've done something if you're a lobby force you never know whether you're making any difference at all but obviously one of the things that's crucial about this and unfortunately it's still the case is that is that climate change remains a remains a political issue rather than a humanitarian issue isn't it and that's the problem that the agreement globally that this needs to be dealt with and and the urgency with which it needs to be dealt with is 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 not there and therefore and therefore that's one of venice's problems isn't it there's too much um debate around climate change for it to be put into the forefront of how to deal with venice's future i think cop 26 is going to be very important you know, have Trump saying, you know, what's Paris got to do with the United States? Um, they'll, they of course, go on people be, be, being people who don't really believe in climate change. But the great majority of countries now believe in climate change. The Italians believe in climate change. The Prime Minister of Italy deeply believes in climate change. So I'm quite optimistic that something will actually happen at this point. Well, Anna, thank you for bringing us up to date with all things Venice. Thank you. The report in the New York Times that I mentioned was by Emma Bubola, published on the 4th of October, and you can read much more about Venice, climate change and tourism on the website or on the apps. And finally, it's time for our work of the week. Oti Heiskanen is one of the most famous Finnish artists and has a show opening today at the Ateneum, part of the Finnish National Gallery and once the site of the Academy of Fine Arts, where Heiskanen was a student. Heiskanen was born in 1937 and the exhibition includes more than 300 works in multiple media from across her 50-year career. The Ateneum's director, Maya Sakari, has decided to talk about the work Dream Play, Fleeting Virginity, made in 1984. Our deputy digital editor and co-producer of this podcast, Amy Dawson, spoke to Maya about the work. 
So O.G. Heiskinen has a major retrospective at Ateneum in Helsinki. And she's a really important figure in Finnish art, known for her printmaking as well as her experimentations in performance art and land art. But I'd say she's not so well known outside of the country. So can you tell us a little bit about her biography? Yes, okay, so she was born in 1937, so just before the the Winter War, which started in 1939, and actually her very small childhood, it was under the shadow of, of the wars, the first the Winter War and then the Continuation War, and she stayed at home with her mother, and actually her father was fighting on the front, and uh, why drawing became so important for her was that her mother said that if she draws constantly, so hopefully her father will come back home. And that is something which is quite special in her work. Of course, she was a talented young child and, and wanted to draw. And because that was so important for her, so the mother <laughs> made up this idea that the father can come back home if she really continues to draw. And that's what happened. And since then, she has always been drawing and she's really a master in drawing. And that is maybe the, the major uh, thing in her art that she, there is so much talent even if she then goes to performance art and to installations and so on and so forth but really the the uh, the trace of her hand is always there and, and she's really brilliant in drawing. Mm. And her work almost probably because of this story that came from her mother it has this magical and mythological quality to it and it and it it's quite surreal looking from an art historical perspective. You see figures like wolves and these very dreamlike environments. And she's touching on topics as well, such as womanhood, the cycle of life and death and shamanism, eroticism. And some of her works really remind me of Leonora Carrington. Did other female artists influence O.T.? I think she she had a really fantastic imagination herself and and her life was quite quite uh, special because actually uh, her great aunts were missionaries in uh, in Sikkim and somehow she always was longing for for Tibet and for for these exotic countries and 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 also his father when he came back from the war he he had a, a, a kind of card playing uh, friends and they were playing cards which was also something very important for Oti and and somehow i think her environment was so so imaginative and 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 there was so much happening even if actually she was living in the countryside and there was outerly there wasn't so much happening but i think she had a very strong uh, inside life and there is for example a story that that at that time when she was a child she was punished and put into a corner but in that corner there were were fantastic uh, items from tibet and sikkim which were sent by the grand uh, grand aunts and actually that uh, that is something that that was always there this this longing for for uh, very far far countries this longing for for different ways of living and and she was actually she was like at home everywhere. Uh, but then, as you were saying um, about her art, what it contains, what kind of, of subject she's dealing with. So one particular happening was really important for her uh, whole career, and that is actually a trauma. She was raped as a young student, and that was something that she felt that, that really somehow she was so uh, brutally violated that actually she denied the whole thing and she she actually uh, says that she never lost her virginity in a way uh, and she actually um, from childhood she grew up into being a grandmother so, so somehow she she says that she had lost her adult uh, age and that that might be true because she she was really in her art she's so playful so 
uh, I mean, there is so much fantasy and it, it's really like, like children's plays and things and she's really free in everything she's doing. And when you asked in the first place why she's not so much known abroad, she is actually quite known in in Sweden, but uh, maybe it's a little bit because of her career that, uh, I mean, which is uh, after the Second World War in the 70s, 80s, uh, which actually at that time in Finland, we didn't promote so much uh, our own Finnish art abroad. So the cause for, for this not being so so known might be there some somewhere there and now we hope really with this exhibition that we could uh, really make her name known also abroad because she's such a fantastic artist and i think this reference to to uh, leonora carrington is is quite amazing and i think there is so much similar in her art with all these women artists after the Second World War with these uh, Mexican surrealist artists or, or then also all these uh, fantastic women performative artists like uh, like Yoko Ono or, or uh, Karoli Schneemann and so on and so forth. So, so there are a lot of similarities. And of course, I have to say that she, she didn't live in a vacuum. So of course she knew about these things that were happening also outside of Finland. But somehow she created her own way of dealing with with uh, her environment, and there is a lot of this kind of, of um, very strong feeling for nature, which is typical for for Finnish people that you really love the forest and you stay in in remote places uh, on a lake shore and so on so forth. So I think there is lots of this kind of, of Finnish mythology as well in her art. I think it's really special that Oti and the museum have this kind of lifelong relationship from art school all the way through to, you know, an important pivotal changing moment for the museum. And now she's coming back and having the ultimate celebration of her work there. Um, that seems really special. Yeah, exactly. And but but what is really pity is that she she cannot herself be present because she's suffering from Alzheimer and she's uh, on a care home and and she she cannot travel anymore. So I don't know whether she she understands that there is this big exhibition going on. But that is somehow. It's also that that Oti is now in in other worlds. Yeah. So that is also part of her career in in a way. Yeah, and it's great to honor her despite obviously her health situation. Exactly. And let's talk about yes. the work that you've chosen to discuss. Um it's an installation by Oti called Dream Play Fleeting Virginity which was made in 1984. And can you describe the work and tell us how it relates and what makes it kind of central to her practice? Yes, yes. So the work it, itself contains of two figures. There is a black figure and a white figure. So evidently the white figure is, is a woman, is a young young virgin or young young lady. And and the other figure is is black it's like a, a kind of animal like figure and this animal like a figure is carrying this this white standing figure in front of him or herself you can't say which sex there is in in this black black figure but there is a threat in this this installation it is actually these two two statues these figures are set inside of a glass box and there is really a feeling of of threatening moment or something that you can't prevent to happen and and that is obviously it is the traumatic experience of Oti Heiskanen when she was young as i told already she was raped and that was really traumatizing experience for her, her as it obviously is for, for everybody who has gone through these kinds of, of things. And this, this idea of not somehow being too violently treated keeps in a way her innocence there. And also in this 
this uh, fantastic installation, you can feel that even if the, the white figure, this woman-like figure, is hurt, she still is whole. She, there is something that is away from her head, something that is somehow dug out from her brains or something, but still she is as a figure, she's a whole. So it's, it's very intriguing uh, installation, actually, and, and she has made also uh, many prints out of this same thematics. So that was something that, that is always coming back in her works. And, 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 and of course, there is a lot of, of joyful eroticism also in her works, but I think there still remains this kind of strangeness between men and women and, and something that is somehow missing or, or, or uh, which is lost also somehow. Yeah. And when you look at um, her other works, particularly her prints, you see this kind of wolf-like symbol, this dark figure kind of reappearing, sometimes in the distance. And this work, it feels almost like she's showing how this experience possesses her and lifts her and carries her through life and in other works it's further in the distance and feels more like she's been able to get away from it. Yes yes exactly that, that's how, how I feel also with this work that it actually shows the, re the, the event itself in a very very uh, obvious way and in other works as you say she has been able to distance herself a little bit from from that experience but still that exists always in in her works thank you so much for sharing all about her thank you Oti Heiskinen is at the Ateneum in Helsinki until the 9th of January 2022. And that's all for this episode. You can subscribe to the art newspaper on the website. Click on the subscribe link at the top left of the page and you'll find a range of subscriptions. Do subscribe to this podcast and a brush with and please give us a rating or review if you've enjoyed it. We're on Twitter at Tan Audio and on Facebook and Instagram, of course. The Week in Art is produced by Julie Mahalska, Amy Dawson and David Clack. David also does the editing and sound design. Thanks also to Henrietta Bentel and Daniela Hathaway and to this week's guests, Carlos and Scott, Anna, Amy and Maya, and thank you for listening. See you next week. Bye for now. The Week in Art is sponsored by Christie's. Visit christies.com to find out more about the world's leading auction house since 1766. Auction, private sales, online, art, anytime.